It's extraordinary teams like the one led by Martia Jan Martina Yanizoto in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh, are fighting hunger around the world. Many others face extremely challenging conditions like farmers working through the California wildfires. Heroes also serve here at home. Through a $100 million emergency fund, our government supports local leaders working tirelessly to tackle food insecurity of the most vulnerable in our midst. To Food for Kids Mississauga, Isna Canada Food Bank, the Compass Food Bank, and all food heroes, thank you. Madam Speaker, World Food Day is followed by the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. And the theme is acting together to achieve environmental and social justice for all. Climate change increases poverty and poverty causes hunger. These crises are linked, Madam Speaker, and we must follow. Honourable Member for Cowichan, sorry, Cowichan Malahat Langford. Madam Speaker, two days ago, yet another overdose alert was issued by Island Health for the Cowichan Valley. These advisories are a symptom of the opioids crisis, which continues to ravage our communities, leaving a trail of shattered lives in its wake. This is our new normal. We are living through two epidemics. In BC alone this year, we have already lost 1,000 lives, five times more than has been claimed by COVID-19. Despite these statistics, the Liberals only gave the opioids crisis a passing reference in their throne speech. This government continues to avoid declaring a public health emergency, continues to ignore experts who are calling for decriminalization, and continues to fail communities who are bearing the brunt of this crisis. My communities are calling out for help. Small businesses, frontline workers, and local municipalities, they are all being overwhelmed. The time for timid policies and half measures is over. We must do better. The Honourable Member for Cumberland Culture. In the region, Halaf established civic society organizations and encouraged dialogue between all parties in the name of peace. On October 12, 2019, the vehicle she was traveling in was targeted by Turkey backed forces on the south of forces south of Tel Abiyad. Halaf will be dragged out of her vehicle, savagely beaten, tortured, and executed. Her body would be mutilated and defiled by militiamen of the opposition Syrian National Army. Hevrin's extraordinary life serves as a poignant example of the struggles Kurdish people face throughout the region. May she rest in peace. The Honourable Member for Hall Elmer. I rise to celebrate the life of Paul Quirk, who passed away early Monday morning. We first met in the 1990s when Paul ran the print shop for the Liberal Party, a job he held until he took his retirement four short years ago. St. Francis said, preach the gospel every day, if necessary, use words. Through his actions, Paul was the Liberal Party for me and countless others. Paul was recognized by his peers as the best print man in town. No matter what impossible print order we asked the night before, Paul would have it done the next morning. Most importantly, Paul was kind-hearted and a great storyteller, whether it was about growing up in Elmer and getting into all sorts of mischief or his adventure in federal politics. His print shop, better known as a Quirken Bunker, was a place to find out what was really going on. Paul leaves behind his wife, Marlene, their son and daughter, and four grandchildren. And to all of them, please accept our deepest condolences. Rest in peace, Paul. The Honourable Member for Ottawa West Nepean. I rise today to pay tribute to former Senator Nick Taylor, who passed away at the age of 92. I first met Nick Taylor when he was leader of the Alberta Liberal Party, which he led from 1974 to 1988. And he was a senator from 90, 1996 to 2002. He was also a successful entrepreneur and innovator in the oil and gas sector, where he was always pushing, even into his later years, to make the industry more environmentally sustainable. Nick embodied the very frontier spirit of Alberta. He was also the funniest man that you would ever meet, as long as you were on the right side of his sharp wit. He was kind, fearless, intelligent, creative, had fierce determination, and an unparalleled passion for his province and his country. He and his wife Peg had just celebrated their 71st wedding anniversary. They had nine children, and Nick used to say when he went to the cattle show that they would bring the prize bull to come and look at him. There will <laughs> never be another man like Nick Taylor. We will miss him. The Honourable Member for Yellowhead. 
Madam Speaker, in my riding, many constituents are not able to get internet service, and for those that have, some can't afford it. Internet is not a luxury. It is an essential service for everyday life. My riding has a population density of 1.3 people per square kilometre. In such a rural riding, there are many remote households. Those fortunate enough to have high-speed connections in cities don't realize how internet is an integral part of everyday life. I'm hearing from parents in Rocky Mountain House with children in school saying they can't afford the cost of internet, and seniors in Grand Cass trying to stay connected but being let down by the reliability and cost. Madam Speaker, a recent report showed Canada ranked 146 out of 155 countries in terms of highest internet cost. Madam Speaker, I urge the government to make internet more accessible, reliable, and affordable for all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Windsor Tecumseh. Madam Speaker, I'm honoured to speak in the House today to recognize the Windsor International Film Festival. WIF is the largest volunteer-run film festival in Canada. And last year, they sold 42,000 tickets and showcased 165 movies over 10 days. WIF also screens the most francophonie films of any festival in Canada, while at the same time serving as a champion of Indigenous and LGBTQ2 pieces, helping spark important community conversations in Windsor Tecumseh. Under the bold leadership of Vincent Georgi, WIF quickly adapted to COVID, transforming Festival Plaza on the Detroit River into WIF Under the Stars, the only drive-in movie theater in the world on an international border. 1,800 vehicles and 4,000 film lovers and families took in the movies. Madam Speaker, the Windsor International Film Festival is the premier film festival of the Great Lakes region. Congratulations, WIF, and thank you to the 300 volunteers that make it a huge success. The Honourable Member for Mission, Musqui Fraser Canyon. Madam Speaker, the Union of Canadian Correctional Officers, UCOSAC, represents over 7,300 members working on the front lines in federal institutions across Canada, and hundreds within my own riding. Correctional officers face significant but avoidable challenges during the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic brought on by unprepared leadership, in consistently applied or completely non-existent protocols and a serious lack of personal protective equipment for inmates and officers alike. This was especially true in my riding where Mission Institution holds the dubious honor of hosting the largest COVID-19 outbreak at a federal correctional institution. ACOSAC has been in contract negotiations with the federal government since before the last election and while COVID-19 slowed down talks for a time they've since resumed. I call on this Liberal government to show our correctional officers the respect they deserve and table a legitimate offer which reflects the important public safety role they play and the risks officers take to keep us safe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Portneuf, Jacques Cartier. Madam Speaker, I would like to thank people from Portneuf, Jacques Cartier who have taken action to minimize the impacts of COVID-19. I'd like to congratulate some people who were nominated by their near and dear. These are people who may consider themselves ordinary, but who are in my eyes completely extraordinary. Thank you, Nicole Amel, for your help to your mother, among others. Thank you, Suzy Paquet, for your many initiatives among the public. Thank you, Sylvie Plamondon, for your involvement in distributing food. Merci, Ginette Plamondon Lambert, for your hard work with the members of your choir. Thank you, Marie Claire Le Sueur, for having uh, modified the produc production of your business. Thank you, Melissa Bouchard, for your involvement among our seniors. Thank you, Manon Chenard, for your virtual musical performances. And merci. Thank you, Cyril Leblanc, for your work in long term care. Thank you very much. Continue making a difference. The Honourable Member for North Island Powell River. Madam Speaker, this Sunday, October the 11th, is International Day of the Girl. On this occasion, I want to highlight a young woman from my riding named Kaylin. Kaylin was frustrated by the increasing acts of racism she was seeing in the news, including in the Comox Valley where she lives, and she knew that she wanted to contribute something positive to the conversation. As an avid runner, she organized a virtual race against racism where participants could sign up and run a 5K route 
of their choice and at the same time raise awareness and funds for Black Lives Matter Canada and the Black Solidarity Fund. Madam Speaker, girls like Caitlin are leading social change in our communities today because they refuse to stay silent when they see injustice. Yet women in this House continue to be underrepresented. We need to work to change this and to encourage and make space for girls like Caitlin because the society they are wanting to build is a better one for us all. The Honourable Member for Laurenti de la Belle. Janine Marion and François Marion are becoming honorary members of the Greater Saint Agathe Chamber of Commerce. At this time, I too would like to underline their contribution to the development of our community. In my opinion, recognizing this couple together is a reason to appreciate their teamwork. Together with their loyalty and hard work, they have laid solid foundations in our community. For decades, they've been investing, investing in many causes, helping the most vulnerable youth, community groups, and business recruitment. They are undeniably a reference within our community. And still today, they are making a difference. Janine Marion, François Marion, thank you on behalf of the entire community of Saint Agathe. The Honourable Member for Calgary Skyview. Madam Speaker, Sunday is International Day of the Girl Child, and as the Shadow Minister for Women and Gender Equality, I'm proud to celebrate the strides Canada has thus far made in empowering and protecting girls. But we still have a long way to go to overcome gender inequality. Sadly, the present government continues to fail Canadian girls during this pandemic by cutting funding to organizations such as London Abused Women's Centre, an organization that protects and helps girls in instances of abuse or human trafficking. Women and girls can be assured that under a conservative government, Canada will always defend, encourage, and advocate for girls as community building students, leaders, and entrepreneurs, both today and tomorrow. So let us all remember all the women and girls in our communities and support them in achieving their goals. Let us remember this momentum and carry it with us all year long, because when girls succeed, Canada and the world succeeds. I wish everyone a happy International Day of the Girl Child. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable uh, Member for Milton. Thank you, Madam I Speaker. Said, said. We know that women have been disproportionately impacted by the effects of COVID-19. Staying home doesn't mean staying safe for women and children affected by domestic abuse and men's violence against women. Halton Women's Place is an essential organization in Milton that offers shelter and crisis services for women and their kids. From the very first day of this pandemic and for many years prior to it, Halton Women's Place has recognized what the pandemic means for women facing abuse, and they've been there to help. Throughout last, the last week of September, I participated in Halton Women's Place's Hope in High Heels event, where men and boys walk in pink high heels to raise money and awareness to end gender-based violence. One of the youngest walkers in Milton was my friend, nine-year-old Rahim, who raised over $1,000. Rahim is a great example for all men. We need to end men's violence against women, and to achieve that, men need to be better allies for women everywhere. Thank you to Diane, Carm, Heather and Lori and everyone at Halton Women's Place for the incredible work that you do every single day. Questions oral or oral questions. Is the honorable member for Calgary knows you. This morning provinces are reporting a record number of new coronavirus cases and a second closure of restaurants is likely imminent. Around the world, experts are using frequent COVID tests to provide results within 15 minutes to prevent business and school closures. But not in Canada. The Prime Minister has failed to get these rapid, easy to get tests. And it's possible that 33,000 restaurant workers in Toronto alone could lose their job in this second lockdown. We don't have job saving rapid tests. Why? Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, again, we see the member of the opposition present false information to the House of Commons. In fact, we do have rapid tests in Canada. They're deployed in rural and remote communities, in areas where there are vulnerable populations and a fragile health healthcare system. Mr. Speaker, we've also approved, Madam Speaker, <laughs> apologize. We've also approved a number of rapid tests recently. As the member opposite knows, there is no one silver bullet to managing COVID-19 outbreaks. We'll be there for provinces and territories and indeed restaurateurs 
members as they manage this new wave of COVID together. I will member for Calgary Nose Hill. Madam Speaker, I would challenge somebody who's watching this in Toronto worried about their business closing to go out right now and try and get a rapid test with results in 15 minutes and see who's presenting the right information here. That answer was arrogant, deceptive and incompetent. Rapid tests keep restaurants open because it means that we can isolate those who are affected rather than shutting everything down. When are we getting rapid tests? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, again, I invite the member opposite to take the briefing with Health Canada so she can understand the complexity of rapid tests and how they can actually make situations even more precarious for communities. In fact, testing is one component of managing COVID-19. We know that we will be there for provinces and territories as they manage COVID-19 outbreaks. We'll continue to be there with additional resources. But, Ms. Madam Speaker, this is, a, this is a complex area. And in fact, in many jurisdictions that have used rapid tests in that way, they have seen worsening of their outbreaks. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. If a woman watching this today has been laid off because of COVID restrictions or her kid's school has been shut down, and she tried to get a rapid frequent COVID test or her school's uh, kids' school tried to do that, she couldn't. That's the reality in Canada. Rapid tests keep schools open. Rapid tests keep daycares open. Rapid tests keep women in the workforce. Yet we don't have those here in Canada. Why has the Prime Minister failed Canadian women and failed to get them rapid tests? Minister of Health. Madam Speaker, around the world there are very high profile examples of how rapid tests have actually added confusion and increased risk of infection. They are not a silver bullet, Madam Speaker. It is very important that whatever tools that we bring to the Canadian market are going to make it easier for communities to manage COVID-19, including sectors like the restaurant sector. We'll be there for Canadians no matter what it takes, Madam Speaker, but this member opposite clearly could use the briefing from Health Canada. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent, Madam Speaker. What a shame to see the government once again acting like this. The reality is that across Canada, there are problems with the fact that there's no rapid testing. For example, Quebec, a thousand classes have been closed. The director of the Principals Association said that it takes twice as long to test than before. If the government had done its work and quickly brought forth wrapping tested, we wouldn't be here today. Why is the government dragging its heels? The Honourable Minister of Health. Madam Speaker, all across Canada, in fact, we've seen an uh, increase of COVID cases. And in fact, we've been working with provinces and territories to make sure they have the tools that they need. I've worked closely with the province of Quebec, with the province of Ontario, in fact, all provinces to make sure that whatever we add as a solution together is going to actually help with the outbreak of COVID-19. The members opposite seem to think that you can test your way out of COVID-19. In fact, that's not true. We need to test, we need to contact trace, we need to isolate, and we need to support business and industry as well as Canadians who have lost their jobs either because of shutdowns or because of uh, infections will be there for us Canadians. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Madam Speaker, that's exactly the problem. Every step is important. The Premier of Quebec asked Quebecers to download the COVID app. I even did it myself. And if I can, everyone can. The problem is that, well, it's nice to have this technological tool but we need rapid testing for things to work for real. My question is simple. How come for six months the government has been dragging its heel and not properly evaluated rapid testing that all Canadians need today? The Honourable Minister of Health. Speaker, and around the world, countries are anxiously awaiting new technology that is going to add to our ability to contain COVID-19. In fact, uh, researchers and technologists around the world are looking for new products and new approaches to testing that will help. But Madam Speaker, we remain firm. We'll be there for provinces and territories as long as it takes for whatever it takes to manage through this next wave of COVID-19. We know that testing is part of the solution, but certainly not all of it, Madam Speaker. And I continue to be there no matter what uh, province or territory needs. The Honourable Member for St. Jean. Madam Speaker, Ottawa is investing $209 million to convert Ford's Oakville factory to one that builds electric vehicles. This is good news, but remember that expertise in electrification of transportation resides in Quebec, not in Ontario. Clean electricity is us. Batteries are us. Charging stations are us. In the throne speech, the government said that it wants to make Canada a global leader in clean energy.
Does it recognize Quebec's expertise? And will it refocus its investment on Quebec's business cluster? The Honourable Minister. Yesterday, we announced that Ford will invest $1.8 billion to set up battery electric vehicle production in Oakville, which will include federal and provincial assistance. This is about Canada, and it's about Quebec. But it's part of a start. It's only a beginning of what we hope is a significant focus on a sustainable and greener economic recovery all across Canada. We see leading actors in this space across the country. In Quebec, Lion Electric. In uh, Nova Scotia, the Honourable before Saint Jean. Madam Speaker, the Bloc is concerned because Ottawa is not an ally of clean industries in Quebec. Expertise in shipbuilding, we have it. Yet Davy, the biggest shipbuilder in Canada, was completely left out of $100 billion in federal contracts. Aerospace expertise, we also have. But there's been no federal aid for one of the hardest hit sectors by COVID or a global policy for the future of this industry. Can the government commit to investing in the electric industry in Quebec rather than relocating our expertise to Ontario? The Honourable Government House Leader, Madam Speaker, while the Bloc Québécois is concerned, we are taking action, investing and electrification of vehicles is good news for everyone, not just for Ontario, but for all Canadians. And it's also going to benefit Quebec companies. We've already uh, seen this in Quebec. So once again, we shouldn't be opposing Quebec with the other provinces. We have to work together to help our country. Well, member for New Westminster, Burnaby. Madam the President, can you Madam Speaker, struggling to get through this pandemic. Small businesses are closing, families are losing their homes, yet Canada's billionaires have increased their wealth by over $37 billion. Canada's web giants have profiteered enormously during this crisis, yet they pay the same in taxes as Donald Trump pays in the U.S. We need action. So why is this Prime Minister so weak on having the wealthy pay their fair share? And why isn't this government putting into place immediately an excess profit tax to ensure that those who profit from this pandemic pay their fair share? The Honourable... Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister. Our government recognizes that for far too long, Canadians have fallen further and further behind, even while those at the top have gotten further ahead. And over the last four years, we have improved tax fairness by closing loopholes, eliminating measures that disproportionately favor the wealthy, and cracking down on tax evasion so that every Canadian has a real and fair chance at success. Madam Speaker, we have also committed to tax extreme wealth inequality, including by concluding work to limit the stock option deduction for the wealthy. Honorable the, the Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Madam Speaker, clearly the Liberals don't have the courage to tackle the, the wealthiest Canadians who are benefiting from the situation. Many companies are suffering and people are taking advantage of this as companies such as Netflix and Amazon have seen their profits explode. explode. And we know that these big businesses do not pay taxes in Canada. These, they do not participate in our collective efforts to fund our health care system and our schools. When will the Liberals have the courage, the Honourable Minister? Madame la Présidente. Madam Speaker, our government recognizes that for all too long, middle class Canadians are getting behind, whereas wealthier Canadians are getting richer. So we did improve fair tax fairness by eliminating loopholes, which disproportionately affect the rich. So we're committing to taxing inequality in, in terms of wealth by limiting tax options for, st for stock options. So it'll be a pleasure to cooperate with opposition members to the Honourable Member for Chicoutimi-le-Fjord. Madam Speaker, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business told us yesterday that 80% of business owners are worried about the impact that the second wave of COVID could have. 
No companies must be left out to ensure their survival. Right now, changes to programs are still slow to roll out. For example, companies that have until October 31st to submit a request for an emergency account still don't have an amended form. What is the government waiting for to announce the updated program? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, we were there for our entrepreneurs and we have been since the beginning of the pandemic. We've helped more than 700,000 companies across the company with our emergency accounts. And I would encourage my colleague and all members of this House to listen to our finance minister today who will announce that we'll be there again for our companies in the second wave of this pandemic, Madam Speaker. For Red Deer Lacombe. Madam Speaker, the Minister of Procurement originally claimed that the government publicly listed all of their contracts and suppliers for PPE online. The Parliamentary Secretary then rebuked the Minister by admitting they've been using the national security exception to keep contracts secret. Canadian companies cannot be competitive for government contracts if they don't know who got what and for how much. Taxpayers deserve to know how much they are paying for non-medical disposable masks. Can the minister tell us how many times she has used the national security exception for pandemic-related contracts since March 15th? The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate the question very much. On July 31st, we disclosed supplier names and contract values for all contracts that Canada has entered into for PPE and other supplies, except certain commodities that have proved difficult to obtain and where additional procurements may be needed. When we see case numbers rising, Madam Speaker, it is extremely important for us to protect our supply chains in order to ensure that we can continue to secure PPE for Canadians now and into the future. Thank here, here. you, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Carlton. Madam Speaker, the government blacked out hundreds of pages of We Scandal documents requested by the Finance Committee. So we raised a point of privilege with your table, saying, could you please help get those documents unblacked out? The Speaker said the Finance Committee should take that issue up. Yesterday it did, at which point Liberals said, no, this is a matter for the Speaker. When we explained the contradiction, the chair of the committee jammed his fist in front of the camera and suspended the meeting altogether. So here we are back in front of the speaker. Madam Speaker, can you help us get these documents unblacked out? Uh, as the member uh, is aware, the Speaker does not answer to questions during question period. And seeing no member rising to answer the question, uh, please go to the next question. The member for Carleton. Mr. S Madam Speaker, I, I feel like I've just called CRA and they've transferred me from one agent who says, no, I have to transfer you back to the other agent who says, no, go back to the first agent. And then when you get back to the first agent, well, the line just goes dead altogether. <laughs> So we have blacked out documents, a deadline, we've been transferred from agent to agent. How the heck are we supposed to get at the truth? The Honourable Leader of the Government in the House. Madam, Madam Speaker, our colleague's been here for a while. He knows that the committees make their own decisions, they do their own job. And 
I encourage, I encourage the opposition to work with us, with Canadians, to help them as we're facing COVID, as we're facing this economic challenge, Mr. Speaker. As they concentrate on politics and communities, we concentrate our work, work and efforts on Canadians. Honourable Member for Regina Lewin. Last week, I rose from, last week, I rose from my seat and took this government to task for hiring a storyteller position in the PMO for up to $96,000 a year. I was mistaken. Today, I can correct the record. We recently learned it was not one, but two storytelling positions they desperately need to fill. Madam Speaker, can someone on the government side please stand and explain to Canadians why this Prime Minister needs to spend $180,000 of taxpayers' money on story time to attempt to repair his damaged image? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I think it's really important. As a government, we have focused our attention on the coronavirus. This is something in which all Canadians want, not only the national government, but also provincial governments. We would ask the Conservatives to do likewise. As the government continues to look at programs, whether it's the CERB program, which is helping millions of Canadians from coast to coast, to wage subsidy programs, which is helping employers. There's a lot more work to do. Hopefully the Conservatives will come on board with other levels of government and support Canadians from coast to coast to coast. The Honourable Member for Regina Lewin. Another sad story from the member from Winnipeg. Here's a true story for the Liberals. In my riding of Regina Louvain, the hardworking members of USW Local 5890 at Everest Steel are facing layoffs. That means a thousand families will be sitting around their kitchen table this Thanksgiving trying to pencil out how to pay their bills. Does this government realize what a slap in the face it is to Canadians everywhere to see their prioritize two storytellers for a combined $180,000 a year to attempt a desperate makeover of this Prime Minister's tarnished image? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, Madam, Madam Speaker, you know, as, as part of the government, obviously we are very much concerned about any sort of layoffs, jobs. That's one of the reasons why we've been so focused on providing the programs that are absolutely essential for Canadians to be able to get through this coronavirus. The uh, wage subsidy program, uh, the CERB benefits, these are programs that are reaching the pockets of Canadians, saving jobs, and that's what this government is focused on. I wish and I would ask that members of the Conservative Party get on side and start working cooperatively in order to combat the coronavirus. The Honourable Member from Maniqua again, Madam Speaker, there's been another slap in the face to Quebec's forestry industry. Yesterday, the government announced $68 million to fight the mountain pine beetle out west. This is in addition to the $200 million Ottawa has already invested. Meanwhile, in Quebec, we have the same issue with the spruce budworm. But we haven't had the same luck as Western Canada. Not one cent in federal aid for Quebec to protect its forest. Nada. When will this government do its share to fight the spruce budworm? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'm happy to answer the question. We're very concerned by the situation. We're continuing discussions with the Quebec government to support the forestry industry there and workers. The spruce budworm is a very serious issue, and we're going to continue to innovate and support the forestry sector in Quebec and across Canada. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Manicua again. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yet, the forestry industry um, has also, in, in the Maritimes, has also had more luck than Quebec's. Ottawa gave it $75 million to fight the spruce budworm, but still not one cent for Quebec. This is special targeted funding to help maritime companies like Irving to protect its private forests at the expense of taxpayers. $75 million for New Brunswick, zero for Quebec, where its infested area is bigger than that of New Brunswick. We're not making this up, Madam Speaker. When will Ottawa stop dragging down the Quebec forestry industry? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. On the contrary, Madam Speaker, we're working in partnership with Quebec for the forestry industry. I've had the opportunity to go to Quebec to support this industry and to in 
Temiskaming and elsewhere. I'm really happy to continue to work with the sector and the Quebec government to support workers and support this extremely important industry for Quebec and Canada. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member for Mission Masqui Fraser Canyon. Madam Speaker, last month the Liberals made yet another housing announcement. $1 billion to be spent in six months to purchase 3,000 units. There has been nothing rapid about this government's previous housing commitments. And without a public plan and application process, it's hard to see how this will be different. So, when can we expect the application information in full? And will the minister commit to providing this house a regional breakdown and running list of all projects approved? Canadians deserve the transparency. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Madam Speaker, the, the, the Rapid Housing Initiative, which the member speaks, is, is, is an innovative and a fundamentally necessary $1 billion investment to the front lines to help fight homelessness as we deal with the COVID pandemic. The member asked for, for transparency, and of course there'll be transparency. There always has been right along all the way with all of the, the projects that we've announced publicly posted through CMHC and reported back to the House. That's part of the National Housing Strategy requirement. So yes, this money will be made available within the few coming days with new criteria for people to apply. And yes, the $55 billion National Housing Housing strategy works alongside the rapid housing initiative to make sure Canadians get the housing they need, the safety and the security they need to make sure the pandemic is injured properly. The Honourable Member for Sarnia Lampton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Restaurant owners across the country have been some of the hardest hit by this pandemic. The government's rent support program was needed, but it didn't work because there was no incentive for landlords to participate. And now the government is intending to ban single use plastics, which the restaurants are currently using to keep us all safe. When will the Liberals stop punishing businesses, and when will they introduce a rent program that works? The Honourable Minister. Um, Madam, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, we've been there uh, for the small business community throughout the pandemic. Uh, we have a comprehensive plan as well to address plastic pollution and the proposed ban for six single-use items will be phased in so uh, businesses and individuals have time to switch to alternatives. Uh, virtually all jurisdictions that introduce bans provide early notice to allow alternatives and uh, we will do the same. Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Markham, Markham Unionville. Ma Ma uh, thank you. Can you hear me, Madam? M Madam Speaker, over the past two weeks, there have been over 20 shootings in Toronto. 13 people have been injured or killed. Those numbers don't include the rest of the GTA. The Liberals have had years to act on rising crime, and they have failed miserably. Madam Speaker, why won't the Liberals get tough on crime and support stricter sentencing? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Oui, merci, Madame la Présidente, euh, et merci pour la question. En effet, c'est un des dossiers qui nous préoccupe. This is one of the files that we are seized with, and as Liberals, we want to ensure that uh, there is far more control. Military-style assault we weapons have no place in our society, and we've invested in the RCMP, and we're going to ensure that the RCMP and uh, information services can do their job to reduce um, access to assault weapons. Madam Speaker, the Nova gas transmission pipeline was to start construction this summer across most of my riding. But on May 19th, after Cabinet already took the maximum 90-day limit to review, they received notice that the Governor and Council extended the timeline by as much as 150 days because of COVID. The end of 150 days is near, and thousands of jobs on the line. Madam Speaker, will they get approval, or is this another pipeline that doesn't get built because of this government? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, in the face of COVID-19 and at the request of several Indigenous communities, our government extended the deadline for decision on the Nova Gas pipeline project in order to safely and meaningfully consult and address outstanding concerns as appropriate. As this House knows very, very well, 
Good projects only get done when we take the time and do the hard work to meet our constitutional duty to meaningfully consult with potentially impacted Indigenous communities. We've learned that, and we're going to make sure that projects get built where we, there is me meaningfully consultations with the-, the Honourable Member for <laughs> Vancouver East. Canadians are struggling to find housing they can afford. In fact, two and a half million families are paying more than 30% of their income on rent. In Van East, the homeless population continues to grow. Empty Liberal promises and announcements will not put a roof over people's head. Meaningful action is required now. While Canadians struggle to pay their rent in a pandemic, the wealthiest walked away with $37 billion in profits. Will this government step in for Canadians tax excessive corporate pandemic profits and invest in housing for everyday people. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Honourable Parliamentary Madam Speaker, since this government took office in 2015, we have been consistently stepping up and making substantial investments in providing housing to Canadians from coast to coast to coast. A $56 billion national housing strategy is just part of that. Additionally, Reaching Home is an example. The, the, the program that serves frontline housing work in, in this country has been increased to almost a billion dollars this year. We just announced a billion dollars for rapid rehousing. These are real dollars helping real people. While the NDP focuses getting people's names into petitions, we're focusing getting people into housing. Our work isn't finished. We will finish this job with a good, strong budget this fall. We are committed to housing Canadians. And Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. Throughout this pandemic, seniors have lived in appalling conditions in long-term care homes, and many have died there too. 80% of the COVID deaths are tied to LTCs. And while Conservatives and Liberal governments built a for-profit system that places shareholders ahead of staffing and seniors' care, Ontario NDP leader Andrea Horvath has announced a plan to actually fix long-term care in Ontario. Madam Speaker, with the second wave upon us, Canadians are demanding national leadership. Will this Liberal government finally put people ahead of profits and take the profits out of Canada's long-term care? Homes. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I share the devastation of the member opposite about the severe lack of protections for uh, some seniors in long-term care homes all across the country. That's exactly why the Safe Restart Agreement included $740 million, Madam Speaker, to provinces and territories to strengthen their infection pre prevention control processes to protect seniors where they live in no matter what province. Uh, Madam Speaker, as you know, the speech from the throne also committed to creating national long-term care standards with provinces and territories, and we're not wasting any time, Madam Speaker. We'll be doing that very shortly. The Honourable Member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I've heard the concerns of parents, families, families, teachers, bus drivers, and school support workers concerning the 2020-21 school year across my riding. Many students have gone back to work in person, to school in person, and we need to continue following public health measures. A family, children, and social development share with share our government what he's been doing to support the provinces and to ensure the safety of the students and staff member during this pandemic. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to thank the member from Nickel Belt for his excellent advocacy and strong work on this file. Uh, the, for the past few months, we, we have been acutely aware of the challenges facing families and children, teachers in the educational system. It's why we worked so hard over the summer to advance $2 billion as part of the Safe School Reopening Program to help schools acquire PPE and cleaning materials and do the changes necessary to keep families and children safe. We've also increased the Canada Child Benefit. We've also made investments in broadband to make sure distance learning is possible for more more kids across this country. The member is right, there is work to be done here, but working with provinces, territories, Indigenous governments, municipalities and school boards, most importantly with families and children, we will make sure the school year is done as safely as possible with federal investments. The Honourable Member for Charleswood, St. James and Cineboya Headingley. Madam Speaker, the St. James Civic Centre in Winnipeg is home to countless programs and events in my community. Their long proposed expansion project includes new space for the St. James Assiniboia 55 Plus Centre. This critical project will benefit so many in my community, including seniors, yet this government won't provide any clear commitment. I emailed the Minister of Infrastructure weeks ago, but have yet to receive an update. 
Ms. Madam Speaker, seniors can't wait. When will the minister provide answers? It's time to get this project done. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And what this difficult time has showed us is that every dollar that we invest in public infrastructure can and must do triple duty. First, Madam Speaker, our government is investing in infrastructure projects that are creating thousands of jobs across the country and growing our economy. Second, we're investing in infrastructure so that everyone gets a fair shot at success wherever they live in Canada. And third, we're investing in infrastructure that makes our communities cleaner and more resilient. Over the next two years, our government is created to creating, committed to creating a million new jobs and building strong communities through investments in infrastructure, including the community centers like the member has mentioned. The Honourable Member for Niagara West. Madam Speaker, Cosmic Plants is a agri small agriculture business in my riding that produces products for major grocery chains. They're planning to expand and hire more people. But to do that, their current staff needs essential training by professionals on the new equipment they purchased from the Netherlands. But because, unlike many other countries around the world, COVID, uh, Canada has no plans for COVID testing, business travel has stopped. Does the minister understand that this government's failure on rapid testing is jeopardizing jobs, not only at Cosmic Plants, but in my riding and around the country? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, uh, every step of the way, Health Canada has been there for industry, for provinces, for territories, indeed for Canadians, approving product as quickly as possible uh, it, within, uh, within guidelines that keep Canadians safe, Madam Speaker. It's very important that the member opposite know that not only have we been approving rapid tests, but we've been reaching out to manufacturers of these tests to ensure that they apply to market these, uh, these technologies in Canada. Madam Speaker, we'll stop at nothing to make sure that we have the tools that Canadians need. The Honourable uh, Member for Port Moody Coquitlam. Madam Speaker, Jacqueline is a single mom with three children, and each one has cystic fibrosis. They take 30 pills and spend two to three hours in chest physiotherapy every day. Jacqueline's life is overwhelmed by appointments and close calls, and her ability to work is limited. Tricafta is a drug that can significantly help CF patients, including children. But just like with COVID rapid testing, Canada is lagging behind on approvals. Trikafta saves lives and should be approved just like it has been with our allies. So why do Canadians have to lose hope because of this government's delays and inaction? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And the premise of the question implies that the member opposite doesn't realize that Vertex has not applied to, uh, to uh, uh, sell uh, Trikafta here in Canada. In fact, we've reached out to the corporation to ask them to apply. We've uh, assured them that we will expedite the review of Trikafta. I met with the Cystic Fibrosis Canada uh, folks uh, last week and talked about this very thing. It's very important that uh, Vertex know that Canada is anxiously awaiting application to ensure that Trikafta is available to Canadians as well. The Honourable Member, uh, no, no, the Honourable Member from Montmagny, Les Lacs, and Moresca, Rivière du Loup. Thank you, Madam Speaker. With no notice, uh, Ms. Alcino and other osteopaths in the country have been abandoned by the CRA. They uh, cannot collect the GST, but the government has decided that they were not recognized as real health workers. A number of these small business people have had to uh, take the burden of all of these costs. So why? Has the government thought, why did it think it was a good idea to impose this new tax in the midst of a pandemic, Madam Speaker? Oh, no, sir, no. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Le President, the excise tax dictates, dictates that manual osteopathic surface services are taxable since they are not regulated by any province or territory. Only osteopathic services provided by a physician are exempt from the GST HST. The agency has not changed its interpretation of the act in any way. Thank you, Madame la Présidente. L'honorable député de... The Honourable Member for Laurentie de la Belle. Madam Speaker, I am going to have to do like your local pharmacy and talk to you about Christmas, even though it's not even Halloween yet. Already, Canada Post has said that it won't be able to make Christmas deliveries on time. There's still two months left, and it's throwing in the towel instead of learning from the delays that it went through during the first wave of the pandemic. We already have uh, COVID. No need for Canada Post to complicate Christmas. What is the government going to do to force Canada Post to deliver on time? The, honor the Honourable Minister. Monsieur le Pre Madame la Présidente, merci. Madam Speaker, thank you very much for the question. It is very important to think of these things before Christmas. 
before the end of the month. Thank the employees of Canada Post for their extremely hard work during the pandemic. They have risen to the challenge. They are essential workers, and I want to assure the member opposite and all members of this House that we are in touch with this independent Crown Corporation to ensure that they will do their very best for Canadians as they have done throughout this pandemic. The Honourable Member for Telbon. Madam Speaker, Canada Post is an essential service, essential, during the first wave of the pandemic, where uh, when Canada Post was uh, stuck in delays, the, the Quebec government was thinking of creating a Quebec Post. And uh, the more or, uh, the time goes by, the better this idea seems to be. Because the management by the government is forcing small businesses to turn to Amazon or Amazon or other private uh, delivery services. It is our local business people who are paying the price because the government is shirking its responsibility. When will... Madame la Présidente, merci. Madam Speaker, thank you once again for the question concerning Canada Post. It is very important to recognize that uh, Canada Post has uh, had to deal with uh, huge volumes of uh, mail and deliveries during this time. Time The employees have worked very hard to ensure that uh, deliveries are uh, continuing to reach Canadians and in Quebec. And during this crisis, and uh, we appreciate their dedication. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Madam Speaker, the ink is barely dry on Kuzma, and now another Canadian industry may be facing tariffs. Blueberries. The U.S. is investigating if Canadian blueberry exports are negatively affecting their industry. 95% of fresh blueberry exports from British Columbia go to the United States. These potential tariffs will be devastating for blueberry farmers in places like the Fraser Valley and Nova Scotia. When will the minister resolve this issue and give certainty to our blueberry farmers? Well, parliamentary secretary. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. We will always stand up for our farmers and our hardworking exporters across the country. Obviously, Canada is extremely concerned about the United States' decision to investigate the export of blueberries. We expect the United States to fully respect all of the terms of the new NAFTA, and Canada will defend our exporters, including the farmers, producers of blueberries right across the country. The Honourable Member for South Surrey White Rock. Madam Speaker, blueberries are Canada's largest fruit export, both in terms of value and volume. Hardworking bl blueberry producers in my riding, like Surrey Farms and Pacific Blueberry, have seen crops decrease by 25% year over year. COVID-19 and CERB have already made it tough to find workers, and now our farmers learn that U.S. tariffs may be on the horizon. Tariffs would be crippling. They need protection. What exactly Exactly is this Liberal government going to do? The Honourable Secretary Parliamentary. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. To be very clear, the reality is that our exports of blueberries do not infringe on any of our agreements, and we will continue to defend our exporters of blueberries. We will continue to defend the entire uh, industry of agri-food from coast to coast to coast, and we will stand up for our exporters, Madam President. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have uh, been visiting uh, important members of the agriculture industry in my riding of countless Canadian farms that have been the victim of coercive diplomacy by China. When can our farmers expect a return to normal? And when will the diplomatic games end so that our farmers can focus on feeding our families? Thank you. The Honourable Non the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um when it comes to our trade policy with China, let me be very clear. As we have said before, the conditions for Canada to pursue a free trade agreement with China are not present at this time. Our priority does remain the immediate release of the two arbitrarily detained Canadians, and we will and we will continue to stand up for our two arbitrarily detained Canadians and push for their immediate release. 
The Honourable Member for Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, in Etobicoke Centre, we are mourning the loss of 43 residents of the Eatonville Care Centre to COVID-19. In May, the Canadian Armed Forces disclosed horrific and beyond reprehensible conditions at a number of long-term care homes, including at Eatonville. That is why, since May, a number of MP colleagues and I have been advocating that the federal government work with the provinces to establish national standards for long-term care. I was so pleased to see that in the throne speech, the government committed to do just that. Could you share with us what the next steps are to establish national standards for long-term care in Canada? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I thank my colleague for his passion and his commitment to ensuring that every senior has the right to live in dignity and safety no matter what province they live in. We're deeply concerned about the outbreaks of COVID-19 that are growing in long-term care again, despite the $740 million that we have provided to provinces and territories to strengthen protections for seniors in these facilities. Uh, I will be working with the Minister of Seniors on a path forward to ensure that long-term care homes have national standards and that they adhere to those national standards so that we can protect seniors from coast to coast to coast. The, uh, the Honourable Member for Belle is a chemin Lévis. Good afternoon, uh, Madam, Madam Speaker. We're in the midst of uh, the pandem pandemic and restaurants are shutting down and the Liberals are playing at uh, Don Quixote. Alliance Québec said that uh, it, it is attacking plastic. What is happening in the Liberals' minds? Did they consult with uh, the Minister, Secretary Parlementaire? Um, Madam, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, once once again, we have been there for our small business community throughout this pandemic, and we will continue to be. Uh, we have a comprehensive plan to address plastic pollution and the proposed ban for six single-use items that will be phased in. So uh, restaurants, like the member mentioned, will have time uh, to adjust. Virtually all jurisdictions that introduce bans provide early notice to allow alternatives to be introduced. We've seen this in many of the provinces, Madam Speaker, and uh, we will follow that path forward. The Honourable Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Madam Speaker, Canada has a time-limited opportunity to preserve jobs and expertise in the aerospace industry. Canadian manufacturers like Arne Prior Aerospace are relying on being part of the fighter aircraft acquisition procurement supply chain to bounce back from the pandemic shutdown of the economy. Can the Minister of Defence assure Canadians that buy Canadian is non-negotiable as are Canadian jobs? Secretary. Madam Speaker, we are committed to making sure that the men and women in the Canadian Armed Forces have the tools and have all of the supports that they need to be able to protect Canadians. We also are very pleased that we have been able to, uh, we are in the process of acquiring 88 fighter jets to replace our CF-18 fleet through an open and transparent competition, something that the Conservatives could not do in 10 years. Last summer, this, we reached an important milestone. We received proposals from three suppliers that we are now evaluating. This competition will ensure we get the right aircraft at the right price while creating job opportunities for Canada's middle class. Thank the you. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Puerto Lakes, Brock. Speaker, in Budget 2019, the Liberals promised Canadians that by 2021, 90% would have reliable internet access. However, the CRTC recently reported that less than 41% of rural communities can connect. Failure to plan was cited in a report by the Auditor General as the reason why the Prime Minister has botched delivering rural internet access. The people of Buckhorn and Apsley are being left behind by five years of empty promises and planning fiascos. Does the Prime Minister honestly think Canadians believe him anymore. The Honourable Minister. Madam Chair, I'd like to correct the record. Budget 2019 and the year 2019 was important for Canadians because we brought forward the first strategy to connect all Canadians to high-speed internet, something that our honourable colleagues in the Conservative side of the House failed to do appropriately while ha they had 10 years to do it. We've connected four times more households and invested to connect more than three, uh, fourfold in Canadian households and businesses to high-speed internet in less than half 
passed the time. We are not done yet, Mr. Speaker, and I hope uh, that our colleagues across the aisle will, will support our efforts to connect Canadians. The Honourable Member for the Northwest Territories. Madam Speaker, in cities across the country, we're seeing the number of COVID cases rise. We know that First Nations, Inuit and Métis face unique challenges combating the spread of COVID-19. Can the Parliamentary Secretary for Indigenous Services update the House on how the, the government is supporting Indigenous people living off reserve and in urban centres? Thank you. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, we understand that er er Indigenous peoples living off reserve and in, in urban centres do indeed face unique challenges. That's why our government has provided $90 million through the Indigenous Community Support Fund to local Indigenous organizations like the Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation, who provide traditional health and wellness services to vulnerable Dene, Inuit, and Métis in the Northwest Territories. We will continue to work with urban and off reserve organizations to ensure that no one is left behind, and I thank the Honourable Member for his leadership and advocacy. The Honourable Men Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This week it was revealed that the Liberals only spent a tiny fraction of the funding they promised in 2018 for international development. The Liberals made a big showy announcement like they always do, and they didn't follow through like they always do. Communities around the world were counting on Canada and the Liberals let them down again. At least the Conservatives undermined our global responsibilities and hurt our international re uh, reputation. They were honest about it. When will the Prime Minister get the full funding promised to those who need it and finally take Canada's role in the world seriously? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank the member for the question. Madam Speaker, these programs represent a significant departure from traditional grants and contributions funding, particularly in terms of their expectation of repayment to the Government of Canada, but are particularly relevant given anticipated global post-COVID recovery needs and their potential to leverage additional public and private financing. I can reassure the member, though, that we continue to adjust our strategies for those innovative finance programs based on an evolving global tech context, as well as lessons learned and working on a number of potential initiatives. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kitchener South Hespler. You are on mute, Tom. Madam Speaker, the cost of housing in my riding has steadily increased over the last decade, pushing many families out of the housing market and into precarious living situations. Currently, the consequences of this pandemic has exacerbated this problem by increasing building costs and housing prices. Home builders say increased material prices will increase a typical single family home by $10,000. Could the minister please update this house and Canadians about the government's plan to make uh, home buying more affordable for Canadians. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much for that question. And of course, the National Housing Strategy addresses the full spectrum of housing needs of Canadians across the country. Our first time home equity uh, purchase program, which supports first time buyers getting into the market, is part of the way in which we're supporting the industry and making sure Canadians have access to affordable housing, whether it's ownership or on the rental side as well as the re rental housing initiative, part of the $56 billion National Housing Strategy, which also assists Canadians finding a home. We've also launched the Canada Ontario, uh, the, the Canada Housing Benefit, which in Ontario is the Canada Ontario Housing Benefit to support housing needs through rent supplements, and that can also go towards low-income home ownership. There are many steps we're taking. I invite the member to meet with me and to talk with the uh, This uh, comes to the end of uh, question period. Uh, the Honourable uh, Member for Calgary Skyview is rising on the point of order. Yes. Um, Madam Speaker, during my statement by members, the Parliamentary Television Services listed me as the Liberal member for Brampton North. Madam Speaker, while I uh, shared the same last name, I'm not the member for Brampton North and definitely not a Liberal. Uh, this unfortunately isn't the first time. During my speech, uh, in reply to the throne speech, uh, the Parliamentary Television Services listed 